Uh, what I want to do is uh, give you an advertising slogan and the year in which it was introduced, and then I want you to try to guess the product. Okay, simple game. We do these games every now and then. So I'm going to give you an advertising campaign and the year, and you tell me what the product was. First, 1906, the great national temperance beverage. Anybody have an idea? Just holler it out. How about this? The pause that refreshes, 1929. Become clearer? Well, this next one will be. It's the real thing. Do you know when that came out? 1969. How about this one? I'd like to buy the world a blank. 1971. How many can remember the song that was part of that commercial? I'd like to buy, <laughs> I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love, grow apple trees and honeybees. It's hard to believe they made this work. And snow white turtle doves. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I'd like to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. It's the real thing. Now, if you're old enough, I probably just started that tape in your head, and within a few minutes, you're going to be dying for a cold Coke. I'm sorry I started that, but just want to lead into our message tonight. Uh, I've often said that Coke is the greatest marketing success the world has ever seen. One researcher recently claimed that the phrase Coca-Cola is the second most recognized phrase on the planet, just after OK. Amazing. From its humble beginnings in Dr. John Pemberton's backyard in Atlanta to sales today in over 200 countries, Coke has now become the most recognized brand in the world. But what I want to point out as we start tonight is that Coke's success did not happen by accident. Coke's success happened because that company successfully associated carbonated sugar water, more uh, accurately, caramel-colored carbonated sugar water, with quality of life. Listen to these ad campaigns. Things go better with Coke. Coke adds life. Open happiness. This is what I call the gospel according to Coke. Because if you think about it, you can substitute the word Jesus for Coke. And almost all of those slogans make perfect sense. One Coke executive says it this way on their website, our work makes people happy. We provide optimism. We refresh people every day. The work I do connects people around the world. My experience at the Coca-Cola company has changed my life. The gospel of Coke then quite naturally became a global phenomenon, a global vision. I mean, if Coke makes things better, then it makes sense to sell it to the whole world. Isn't that true? And so the Coca-Cola company set about the business of penetrating as many markets, as many cultures, as many languages as possible, and they've been remarkably successful. In other words, the company established a mandate, a vision, we will sell Coke to the whole world. Now, today we begin a brand new series of messages called Beginnings, Reaching the World. This is the first series in a year-long study of the book of Acts. Uh, we've never done this before. We've never taken one book and studied it for a whole year. Jeff and I began look, talking about this back in June, and we read through the book. We started talking about it, thinking about it, and we thought that this, we really came, became convinced this is what God wants for us as a church family. We're studying the book of Acts this whole year, and as part of that, uh, we've created this book of Acts journal. They're available out in the lobby. They're just $3. We kind of needed to print them last minute. So if you have the three bucks on your grade, if not, it's honor system. The worship cafe, they're probably in the back. But this has the entire text of the book of Acts in it, broken into the series segments that we're going to be studying. So you can read the first portion, track along for six weeks. Then we'll go to a next series. So there'll be six major series from the book of Acts, all having to do with themes uh, regarding reaching. And I, we hope they'll help you track along. You can keep notes in case you're ever frustrated because you don't have enough space in the back of your sermon notes page to take notes. But here we are, we're beginning today. And Acts is the story of a global vision, only not for a soft drink. Acts is all about the reaching power of the gospel. The gospel that reaches across cultural and language barriers. The gospel that reaches real people where they are. And the gospel is intended to reach the world. Now, a little bit of introduction before I read today's verses. When I, uh, the part I'm going to read takes place about 40 days after uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, the 11 remaining disciples, you know, the 12 minus Judas who uh, took his own life, and a few of their closest friends are still trying to figure out what it all means. They've experienced a great deal. 
and they're trying to figure it out, and that's where we pick up the story, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Let me read for you. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Let me pause there before I continue. So who's writing here? The author of the book of Acts is believed to be Luke. And this is a continuation of his first book, which we know as the gospel, according to Luke. Luke was an educated man, a medical doctor, most likely Apostle Paul's personal physician who traveled with him a great deal. Interestingly, Luke is also the only Gentile writer, the only non-Jewish writer in the New Testament. But who is this guy, Theophilus, that Luke addresses his book to? We aren't quite sure because Luke never addresses him, identifies him directly, but we can make some guesses. The name Theophilus is Latin and uh, literally means friend of God. And so this has led some to believe that this is Luke's way of addressing sort of a, a generic uh, book to anyone out there who's a friend of God. On the other hand, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke calls Theophilus most excellent Theophilus, which seems to indicate that Theophilus might have been a Roman governor or official of some sort who was a believer or maybe at least sympathetic to the great story of Jesus. And finally, a third possibility is that Theophilus was a very wealthy businessman in that uh, time, and he personally supported the mission efforts of Paul and Luke as they traveled around the world with the gospel. And this is Luke's way of giving him a report about all that God had been doing. Okay, let's pick up the story. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood beside them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now we're going to pause there and uh, teach on this passage here this evening. The first thing we see is what I'm calling the mandate. We see the mandate. Some of you will remember these words. You may be able to help me finish them. Space, the final frontier. Okay, what show? Star Trek. Trek. Okay, these are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Those are the words, of course, of Captain James T. Kirk. Anybody know what his middle name was? Tiberius. Tiberius. I did not know that. I wonder why they named him that, James Tiberius Kirk. Many of us watch Captain Kirk and Spock and Scotty and the rest of the crew of the Enterprise every week because you had to wait each week. You couldn't do it on like TiVo or something like you can now, but you had to wait and watch it each week because they faced a brand new adventure every week. Their mandate, their mission was to explore strange new worlds, to boldly go where no man had gone before. Here as Acts begins, Jesus himself gives a clear mandate, a mission, And it comes in three parts. He says, you will be my witnesses. Now, what does it mean to be a witness? A witness is simply one who testifies to that which one has seen, heard, or experienced personally. A witness. I can be the witness of a high school football game. Saw a great one just last night. I could be the witness of a great movie or a great concert so long as I went to that movie or I went to that concert. I can only be a witness of that which I have seen, heard, or experienced personally. Secondly, witnesses of what? Of who? Witnesses of Jesus, of the gospel. Now, what does it mean to be a witness of Jesus? What it does not mean is that you have to be a pastor or a missionary or someone with an advanced theological degree or be able to quote huge chunks of the Bible by memory. It just means 
you're willing to share what you have seen, heard, or experienced of Jesus. I thought of a story as I was reading through this passage this week. I grew up in a small church uh, where we had Sunday evening services. How many of you grew up in a church with Sunday night church? How many of you remember missing the, white, the Disney uh, show every Sunday night because of church? I remember that. And I'm still a little bit bitter about that, just a small bit. My dad was the pastor, which is why we were there on Sunday evening. And on uh, Sunday evenings, he often reserved the time for what we call testimony time. We call those faith stories today. People could just stand up and share whatever God had been doing in and through their lives. So one Sunday night, a lady stood up just about two rows behind where my brother and I, my younger brother Joe and I, were sitting with my mom. I, I was probably about uh, 12 at the time. He was about 9. And we're sitting there trying to stay awake during Sunday night church, bitter because we're not watching Disney at home. And this lady stands up about two rows behind us, and she gives uh, a testimony. And she starts talking about, uh, and it becomes very clear early on that she's, she's well, I didn't recognize her. She's brand new to the church. We had a small church, so you knew people who were new. And she's talking about what God had recently done in her lives. It becomes clear that she's just recently heard the gospel, just recently given her heart to Jesus, just recently begun to experience her work in his life. And at some point, as she came to the end of her little testimony, she said, I know I have, she was weeping. She said, I know I have a heck of a lot of change to do. But with Jesus' help, I'm going to change. But only she didn't say heck of a. She said a word you're not supposed to say in church. And my brother and I were just aghast. We're like elbowing, we're like 12 and 9. We're like, did you hear what she said? She, you can't say that. She said, we're, we're like, we just thought it was amazing that she said that. Uh, but as I look back on it, there were two really wonderful things about what that woman said that night. And that's why I still remember them to this day. First, her story was genuine. She didn't even know enough that, to know not to say that word in church. She didn't know enough. It was so genuine. Second, everyone in church that night, with the exception of my little brother and myself, celebrated what that woman had to share. Nobody judged her because she used a word. No one did. They accepted her and they loved her and they celebrated because she simply bore witness to Jesus and what he was doing in their lives. She did what Jesus is telling his followers to do as the book of Acts begins. She became a witness to him. Thirdly, Jesus says we are to be witnesses to the whole world. To the whole world. From the very beginning, the gospel has a kind of centrifugal force. That is, it radiates outward from a, from a center point, like a, like a sprinkler, a spinning sprinkler in a yard, just flinging water out as far as the sprinkler can throw it. God always intended for his grace to reach all peoples of the world. From Abraham to the incarnation to the cross to the resurrection to the promise of the Holy Spirit, the intent of the gospel is to reach the world. Now, here's the point for us today as we begin. We are all witnesses of something. We all know how to do that. It might be to the last movie we saw. It might be to our favorite restaurant. It might be to the game I saw last night. Or it might be of what Jesus is doing in our lives. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you have believed the gospel, received the gift of eternal life, then you too are a witness. The only question is whether your witness is passive or active. The only question is whether your witness is hidden or public, whether it's silent or heard. But we are all witnesses. That's Jesus' mandate. Secondly, in these first 11 verses, I see the power. We see the mandate and then we see the power. A couple of weeks ago, um, I traveled to um, the boundary waters between Minnesota and Canada with one of my sons on a trip that we've been planning for some time. Ten-hour drive. How many, how many have ever been up there to fish or whatever? Ten-hour drive up there, and then you have to either rent a boat or a canoe to travel across this vast lake to find your campgrounds. And so we had a choice to make, canoe or powerboat. So I was asking the guy who was taking it up there, tell me what the difference is. Well, the canoe, of course, you, you paddle on your own, and then you carry it up across an island, then you paddle some more, and then you carry it across another island, then you paddle some more. Okay, how's the powerboat work? He says, you sit in it, and, and you just go. <laughs> and we were like, uh, powerboat. It wasn't really a hard choice for us, okay? 
Look at how the text continues. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, notice a couple things here. First, notice the disciples at first misunderstand what Jesus is trying to tell them. They go, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Think about that. This is like a a high school football team. I'm sorry, I just got football on the mind. I mean, it's the start of the season and all that. But it's like the team gathering in the locker room before the first game of the season and before the coach can give his pregame talk, a kid raises his hand and goes, Coach, is this when we get the trophy? And he goes, uh, not exactly. First, you have an enormous challenge ahead of you. you got nine weeks of games against opponents who are all working to to knock your heads off. Then you got five weeks of playoffs. And yeah, maybe then you're going to get the trophy. But there's a lot that lies ahead. Second, notice that when Jesus says, you will receive power, he's implying that the mandate cannot be accomplished without help. In other words, you're not going to make it rowing on your own. You're going to need help. You're going to need power. Thirdly, notice Jesus says the power to accomplish the mandate comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to talk a lot more about the Holy Spirit next weekend when we get into Acts chapter 2, so you might want to read ahead in your journal or in your Bible. But we need to at least introduce the Holy Spirit because of the role the Spirit plays from this point forward. Several things the Holy Spirit is not. First, the Holy Spirit is not like the force of Star Wars. It's not this impersonal power in the universe that people talk about all the time. The Holy Spirit is not synonymous with human emotion or human motivation, although the Spirit can produce great emotion and great motivation, but it's not human in nature. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, that is God, eternally existent as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible teaches. God the Father can be understood as the sovereign creator of all things. God the Son is the incarnate God, Jesus, who gave himself as the final sacrifice for sin. We celebrated him here to this evening. And then the Holy Spirit is the presence and power of the risen Jesus who lives in the heart of every believer and in the body of Christ, his church. In short, the Holy Spirit is the aspect of God's being that can be experienced personally. The Holy Spirit is the presence of Christ dwelling in our hearts. This is what makes Christianity absolutely unique among all the religious traditions, all the faith systems of the world. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, Paul teaches, When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. What that says is dramatic. It says that when you accepted Christ as Savior, when you believed the gospel, you received three gifts, all three of them completely. You received forgiveness from sin. We we, uh, celebrated that tonight. You received the gift of salvation that is eternal life, guaranteed through Christ's sacrifice. And you received the gift of the promised Holy Spirit that is Jesus in spiritual form who dwells in your heart. When God speaks to our hearts, It's the Holy Spirit. When we experience the encouragement or love of Christ, it's the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, counselor, advocate to be with you forever. In John 16, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. And here Jesus says, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Now we're going to talk again more about that next week in Acts chapter 2. But I want you to notice here today the connection between the power and the mandate. You will receive power. You will be my witnesses. Now this is important and we can miss this. Jesus wants to know, wants us to know what the power is for. You're going to receive power, this gift I give you. I want you to know how to use it. 
Notice, the power of the Holy Spirit is given not so that we can run marathons, not so that we can win Super Bowls, not so we can be successful in business, although God is certainly interested in every aspect of our lives. The power of the Holy Spirit is intended, first and foremost, to make us His witnesses. That's how we start. Again, much, much more as we get in Acts chapter 2 next week. Thirdly, we see in these first 11 verses the promise. So we have the mandate, the power, and the promise. Let me ask you to remember back, those who are um, a little more advanced in age, some of you may be experiencing this right now, but remember back in middle school or high school? I, I know it can be a little painful, but bear with me. Remember those times when your teacher would give you an assignment and then leave the room for some reason? Remember? What would happen next? You don't have to admit this, but for me, what happened next depended greatly on whether or not I believed my teacher was what? Coming back. Now, if I thought there was a good chance she wasn't coming back before the end of class, or he, uh, then I had a tendency to kind of goof off with my friends. Kids, don't follow my example. I paid dearly for that as time went on. But I would just goof off with my friends because she wasn't coming back. But if she said she was coming back and I knew her to be a person of her word, then I would probably try to get my assignment done so that when she came back, I was prepared. That's just the way I operated. Notice here. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taking, taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now for me, it might be just me, but this is one of the subtle examples of God's tremendous sense of humor. Think about it. Think about the emotional and spiritual roller coaster these disciples had been on. They had witnessed the crucifixion. They had seen the cross. Jesus was dead. All hope was gone. And then they became witnesses to the resurrection. He was back. And all hope is back again. Now he tells them he's going away. Oh, he's going away again. But he's going to send his Holy Spirit as a gift. Okay, that's good. And then he ascends into the clouds right in front of their eyes. You, you picturing this story? If I was there, here's what I'd be doing. Right? Isn't that what you'd be doing? Think about what you just saw. And then the angel says, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? I think that's funny. Really? Why? Why am I? Because Jesus just lifted off. Did you see that? It just cracks me up. And then they say, they say this. This Jesus who was taken up from you will come in the same way you saw him go. Now here is one of the great promises of our faith. Jesus is coming back. This promise is reiterated in almost every book in the New Testament. Jesus is coming back. In John 14, Jesus promises to return to take us to be with him where he is. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that when Jesus returns, the dead will be raised and will receive our new spiritual bodies. The book of Revelation says that we will see Jesus revealed as the king who will return to judge all sin and rule with absolute authority in the new heaven and new earth. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul writes, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me in that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. He's coming back. He's coming back. It seems to me that there are two sides to this promise of Jesus' return. First, as believers, the promise of Christ's return is to give us great hope. It means that no matter what happens around us, what happens to us, whatever hardship or suffering we may endure, remember, almost all of these early, many of these early believers were martyred eventually for their faith. In the end, he will take us to be with him where he is. Great hope. But second, the promise of Jesus' return also compels us to invest ourselves fully in the mandate he has already given us. Time is finite. History as we know it will have an end. My history will have an end. Your history will have an end. All human history will have an end. And he calls us to take the gospel of salvation to the whole world before that time comes. Now, many scholars believe the crown of righteousness Paul's talking about here is a kind of special reward, above and beyond salvation, promised by Jesus to those who have been faithful to serving the cause 
of the gospel here on earth. Those who have served the mandate. We don't know what the reward entails exactly. But we do know that Jesus left us with a mandate and he will honor those who serve that mandate well. So, as we wrap up the beginning of this first series in the book of Acts, Jesus left us three promises. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We have received that promise. We're part of that promise. He said, I will send my spirit to be with you forever. If you're a believer here today, you have received that promise. And then he said, I will come back. We look forward to that promise. And he gave us one mandate. Three promises, one mandate. The mandate is you will be my witnesses. Jesus' mandate is that the gospel will be taken to the whole world. His method is us. This series, the whole book of Acts, is about what happens when the followers of Jesus accept that mandate. A British writer and philosopher named G.K. Chesterton said it this way. The more I considered Christianity, the more I found that while it had established a rule and order, the chief aim of that order was to let the good things run wild. I love that phrase. Let the good things run wild. The book of Acts, in a way, is the story of what happens when the good things run wild, when the gospel is turned loose in someone's life, when it's turned loose in the world. What happens is the great adventure called the church. And each one of us is called, invited, to join that adventure. Will you bow with me as I close tonight? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the great gift of the gospel, for the great gift of your church, for the great gift of your spirit. And so often I think we take all three of those gifts somewhat for granted. May we not take them for granted. And may we participate in the great adventure of letting the good things run wild, of sharing your gospel with the world. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.